Thank, thank you very much, Steve. I would like to talk about three decisions I made in my life that you could say were maybe fearless decisions or try to be fearless. Two of them are not the ones I want to focus on. It's the third one. But let me just talk about the first two that Steve alluded to. I am from Baltimore. I grew up in a uh, northwest Baltimore. The people who were Jewish in Baltimore had to live in a very narrow area because the mortgages forbade you to sell a home to somebody who was Jewish when I was growing up. So I didn't know anybody who wasn't Jewish until I was about 13. And uh, ultimately, I realized that if I was going to really do something with my life, I had to get a good education. My parents uh, were not doctors or lawyers or professional people. My mother or father did not go to, go to college. Neither of them graduated from high school either. So with the help of scholarships, I went to college and law school. But I decided after I got ready to practice law and was practicing law that I didn't really love it. And my theory in life was that if you don't love what you're doing, you'd never be really good at it. So my other theory is don't just do what your mother tells you to do. If you do what your mother tells you to do, you know, your mother might be happy, but you won't be very happy. So you have to find something you really want to do in life. My mother thought the highest calling of mankind was to be a dentist. And I just didn't think it was really for me. So I decided after I went to law school and practiced law, I decided I just really didn't like it as much and I probably wasn't as good at it. When I told my clients I might be leaving, they didn't seem to mind. When I told my, <laughs> my colleagues at the law firm I might leave, they didn't seem to mind. But one of the people I was working for was a man named Ted Sorens, and he had written a brilliant speech for John Kennedy, the great inaugural address, in which Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I was inspired to try to do something for my country, so I decided to, to leave the practice of law and give up whatever accoutrements it might be, and really go to help my country. And I went to work in a campaign. I went to work for a campaign of Jimmy Carter. He was running for president in 1976. When I joined his campaign, he was 33 points ahead, and he won by one point. So uh, <laughs> Carter always wondered, what was your contribution? But White House staffs are not filled on merit. They're filled on uh, people who worked in the campaign. So at 27, three years out of law school, I'm the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States, a job I wasn't qualified for. Um, but he wasn't qualified either, I thought, so. Um, <laughs> nobody was qualified. So uh, I managed to get inflation to 19%, which is very difficult to do. I got <laughs> mortgage rates at 22%, also very difficult to do. And as a result of that, uh, we didn't get reelected. So all of a sudden, people told me how brilliant I was, how smart I was, that I should come and work for them. They didn't return my phone calls because we lost the election in 1980 to Ronald Reagan. So I had to go back and practice law. And once again, I realized that while I had made a, maybe a courageous decision to get out of the law and, and join politics, it didn't really work out for me or the country, really. So I went back to practice law again. And once again, my colleagues said, well, if you want to do something else, that's fine. And my partner said, if you want to do something else, no problem. So I took a decision that ignored not just my mother, but also my father and my wife and my children, all of whom said, what are you going to do? I'm going to leave the practice of law again, and I'm going to start a, law, a, a, a private equity firm, the first one in Washington, D.C. So with no money and no real knowledge, I started up a firm here about five blocks from here, uh, 25 years ago. It's now grown to be about the largest private equity firm in the world, and we manage about $160 billion, and we've now invested about $80 billion of, dollars of equity and, and, and earned about 31% a year for 25 years. So that has produced a very large firm and a lot of happy investors, as you might expect. And then I realized when I turned 54 that on, on average, a white Jewish male will live to be about 81. So doing the arithmetic quickly, I realized that I had lived two thirds of my life. The firm is very successful, but I hadn't really done a lot with the wealth to give it away. And I realized that I probably should spend the rest of, rest of my life trying to give away the money that I had uh, accumulated, and I didn't feel that if I left it all to my children that the world would be a better place. Very few people um, <laughs> who've won Nobel Prizes have won Nobel Prizes because they inherited $500 million and they were spurred to, to work harder. So I decided I wanted to give away my money, and with Steve uh, and Gene Case, I am one of the original, I guess, 75 people who signed the giving pledge with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, where we pledged to give away at least half of um, our money. Um, but, but I, I, I don't want to give away at least half my money. I want to give it, that, that pledge says you give away at least half your money by the time you die or, or, or upon death. And I don't really, you know, if you die and you haven't given away half your money, uh, how are they going to come in and really penalize you? So I, I, I really want to give it away during my uh, lifespan. I don't want my executors to give it away the money. So I'm spending a fair amount of my time while I'm still helping to run my firm. 
I am spending a lot of my time trying to give away the money and do it in a sensible way. Now, my view on philanthropy is, is, is this. Philanthropy is an ancient Greek word means loving humanity. It doesn't mean billionaires giving away cash. It means loving humanity. And so for the ancient Greeks, what they meant was you can do other things to help humanity. So I tell people philanthropists are not people that just give away money. It's people who give away their ideas, their time, their energy. And so everybody can be a philanthropist. If the giving pledge has one fault, it is that may have conveyed the notion that only billionaires can be philanthropists. The truth is everybody here can be a philanthropist. Everybody has some time, some energy, some ideas. And, and if you have any money, you can give that as well. And so I encourage everybody to give away money or their time, their energy, and be a philanthropist because one, I think you'll feel better about yourself. If you feel better about yourself, you'll probably live longer because generally people feel good about themselves. They tend, they tend to be healthy and they live longer. Secondly, you might actually help other people, and that's a great thing in life to do to help other people. And third, maybe you'll get to heaven more quickly. Now, I, <laughs> I can't prove that, but why would you take a chance? So... <laughs> I have tried uh, to find many different ways to give away my money, as Steve and Gene Case have as well, and there are many different areas I'm involved with, but let me mention one today that really hasn't gotten that much attention. Uh, I've done some things in this area that have received attention, but it's an area that really doesn't get much, that much philanthropic attention. Let me explain it. Um, a, a couple years ago, I was in New York. I heard that the Magna Carta, the most famous document in history, was going to be auctioned off. I didn't understand what that meant because I figured, how can the Magna Carta be auctioned off? I went there and I was told that the Magna Carta, there are actually 17 Magna Carta copies left. One was in private hands. It had been owned by Ross Perot. He was going to auction it off to the highest bidder. Although it wasn't written in this country, it was the document that was the inspiration for the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, our, our Constitution, and I thought it should stay in this country. So I decided I was actually going to buy it and give it to the country as a gift to the country. And I didn't want to tell my wife, it would sound presumptuous to say I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. Um, so, and I didn't want to tell my children, they'd say how much less money will this mean for us. Um, so I just resolved to come back the next day, go to New York. I went there, the auction started. I'm not an art buyer, so I didn't really know much about it. I started bidding and all of a sudden they came in and said, you won. So I, they said, you bought the Magna Carta. You can slip out the side door and you can, uh, nobody will know who bought it and just as long as you, you can pay for this, right? I said, yes. Okay, so, uh, and I said, no, I, I don't want to do that. They said, well, there's 100 reporters who want to know who, who bought the Magna Carta. I said, well, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to them. And I went out and said, this country has been great to me. I came from a parents who had no money, I had no money, and I've, I've made now a great deal of money, and I want to give back to my country. And this is a down payment on my debt back to the country, because I'm going to give this Magna Carta to the United States government. And I did that, I gave it to the National Archives, it's now there on permit alone, I hope when you're, any of you are in Washington you'll go see it. It's, it's a document that is now about almost 800 years old. And as a result of doing that, I began to realize I could buy other historic documents and put them on display so other people could see what our country's history is about and really realize these documents and, and, and appreciate them maybe in ways they hadn't before. So I bought a rare copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. I gave it to President Obama. It's now in the Oval Office. I bought a rare copy of the Declaration of Independence. I gave it to the State Department so the people who visit the State Department I can see that. And, and shortly I'll be buying some other documents that will be disclosed. One of them I have recently bought is the 13th Amendment which freed the slaves and ended slavery. And it's now going to be going to the African American History and Culture Museum when that opens in the Smithsonian on the Mall. So, um, what, what I've tried to do is this, I, there are many great causes in the world. There's a lot of healthcare causes I'm involved with, a lot of education causes, but people don't realize that some part of our, our society that really needs a lot of money is the federal government, particularly for the cultural things it does. The federal government has a terrible debt. It has a $16 trillion of debt. We're running an annual deficit of $1.1 trillion, and that's not going to be solved anytime soon. So finally, when we resolve how to deal with these problems, we're going to have to be cutting back at the federal government money that goes to support enormously important cultural institutions. So in this city, the Smithsonian, the National Gallery of Art, the Kennedy Center, um, the National Archives, all these institutions that are heavily dependent on federal money aren't going to get as much in the future. And so what I try to tell people to do, and I hope all of you will think about this, to the extent that you can, try to adopt something in the federal government that has been good to you, something that's been helpful to you. Maybe it was a part of the Smithsonian, maybe it was a part of the National Archives, the National Gallery of Art, the Kennedy Center, uh, whatever it might be, something that you think is for free and the government should be paid for, but the truth is there isn't going to be enough money for that in the future. And so try to do something that will give back to the country that has been so good to you. This is the greatest country on the earth, and there's no doubt about it. It has lots of problems, we have lots of flaws, we have many mistakes we've made, but there is no other country that I think I would rather live in, and there's no other country to which I think I owe such a great debt or could possibly 
owe such a great debt. So what I wanna to try to do is encourage people to think about the federal government as a place that they can help and think about what John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do to you, for you, but what you can do for your country. Now what he was talking about is people going into the country service, maybe going to the military or going into uh, public service in some way, but there are many other things that he really he meant by that and everybody can do something to help your country. Now there's not just things in Washington DC, some of you obviously don't live in Washington and there are many federal institutions around the world, that, around the country that you could help, but for example, take the, the Washington Monument. Um, it wasn't something that uh, I really had thought a lot about, but when the earthquake damage occurred, I realized that it needed money to be repaired. It was gonna take a long time for the federal government to figure out what to do, so I put up a large part of the money that was necessary to repair the Washington Monument because it really had been good to me. When I was a young child, I came here many times. My parents would take me up, up the, uh, the monument, and when I went to see it most recently, um, they, they, they took me in, they gave me a tour, they, they, they gave me, let me take the elevator down. They realized I was too old to walk up, they, I, think they, I think they thought, but I, I think there's an example where um, something had been meaningful to me in my life, the Washington Monument, just as the Smithsonian had been because the Smithsonian uh, was a place that I visited so long for so many times, it's for free, of course, and therefore I had the chance to learn a lot and get things for free for my country. So now what I wanna do is give back to my country things that I am able to do. So I do have the ability to give away money, but I really, I think one of the more valuable things I have to give away is way is my time and my energy and try to inspire other people to think about the federal government as not just somebody that takes money from you when it ta taxes you, but as somebody you can give money to, you can give your time to, you can give your energy to, and you can help make this country a better place than it already is. And I've no doubt that if you think about this, you will be able to find something that has been meaningful to you in your life that the federal government or any other government, it can be a state or local government, uh, that has been helpful to you, help, uh, help do things that can make sure the culture of our country is perpetuated, people know more about the culture. Take American history, for example. One of the things I focused on is trying to get people to know more about American history because sadly, people know so little about our history. When I put these documents on display, I'm hoping that people will learn more about the history and think more about it. For example, recently it was disclosed that more high school students know the first three names of the Three Stooges than they know the first three names of any of the founding fathers. Uh, another survey by Pew indicated that when asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, 40% of Americans said the Rhine River, which is not in our country. 35% <laughs> of Americans when asked who was the first Secretary of Treasury said Larry Summers. Now, a very good Secretary of Treasury, but he wasn't really the first. Um, so my view is Americans know so little about their country's history and the and, and if they were to learn more, I think they would appreciate the flaws we have, but also the great things that this country has. So what I'd like you all to think about, and I'd like anybody that might be watching to think about, is don't just think of the federal government as a gigantic entity in Washington, D.C. that's fighting with each other and can't really get its act together. There's a lot of those problems for sure. But it's a place that has been able to provide cultural kinds of benefits to people around our country for a long time. The Smithsonian is a wonderful example. More than 20 museums, all of them are free. Many of them are, are within a walking distance of here. And yet, in the future, the federal government is unlikely to be able to have the money necessary to keep those at the current stage. So the, the Smithsonian, or the Kennedy Center, I am now the chairman of the Kennedy Center, and the Kennedy Center is a wonderful institution in this city to provide performing arts and arts education to people from all over the world. But if if we don't have the money from the federal government in the future for that or for other institutions, we won't be able to let people know about our culture. We won't be able to let people uh, realize how great this country is. So as you think about what you want to do with the rest of your life, try to think about this. I think everybody is put on earth for a certain purpose. We won't know what this purpose is while we're in life, but we're put here for a certain purpose. And what I think everybody should want to do is try to make the world a better place than, than, when, than when it was when you came here. So try in your little way to try to give something back or in your big way, whatever way you might be able to do it, your time, your energy, your ideas, or if you have money, fine. You don't need to give money. You have plenty of other things you can do, but try to make the world a better place and particularly try to make the country a better place. All of you who are Americans here, and maybe most of you are, have benefited from the great things this country's had, as I have. I have I've come from very modest circumstances to the point where I now can give back to our country a great deal, and I want to do that. And my theory is that the country will be a better place for my having done this. And while it's not a fearless thing, I wouldn't say it's, it's a great uh, thing that I've done that's fearless, I do think that giving away virtually all your money is something that many people don't think about doing, but I think I actually am happier for doing it. And my children and my family and my wife are happier for, for my doing this because they, they realize that I am happy doing it, I might be helping other people, and ultimately, the money isn't really that important. You can always make money. There's no evidence that money makes people happy. The most 
the most important thing and the most elusive thing in life is happiness. Remember what the most famous words in the English language, the most famous sentence was written by Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is very elusive. You don't need money to be happy. Try to help other people. Try to give back to your government and try to make sure you say to people, I wanna thank people for giving me this wonderful country and this wonderful government. Thank you very much.